Let's talk a little bit about parts of a sword, of a Japanese sword. If you don't mind, and we'll go from there. This will help you understand a little bit about what we're doing in our destructive tests, what we're going to try to see the durability of, how these components work together. We'll start from the back. This is a Kashira, our end cap. It's basically just a fitting which fits on the end of the suka, which is a handle. It also helps the structural integrity of the suka, along with the collar up here, the fushi. These help keep the suka together under tremendous pressure, as you understand. It has to, it has to be under. Wrapping the suka, the suka ito, and this is you know, on the Ronin brand. These are silk. Um, don't even know what to call it. Silk ribbon that is used to wrap in different patterns. This one's a Hanari Maki pattern and different patterns. And it serves double purposes. It's, it's, it's absolutely helps hold this whole suka assembly again, together again against the pressures that go against it. It also makes a very nice tactile grip. Underneath the suka ito, we have the Samagawa. It's stingray leather. Now you may not know this, stingray leather is the toughest leather on the planet. It can be cut, but it cannot be torn. So the Japanese also use this for a dual purpose. They would put a full Samagawa wrap around it, the suka, and that wet, and as it dry, it would shrink, and it would help, really help make that suka bulletproof, really hold it in place, along with the Fushi Kashira and the suka ito. At this point, you've got something that's not coming apart hardly at all. Now the other purpose, and the, it was used, the Samagawa was used for, and which we mainly use it for today, being as how many of us aren't going into battle anymore, is it helps grip the Suka Ito and keep it in place because it has these nice little nodes all over. It's almost like sandpaper. Okay, so we've looked at all that. This is our Manuki. This is just a handle ornament. It's originally thought that in the early days, the Manuki were used to cover the Makugiana or the Makugi pins which retain all this together are but as time went on its purpose was became different and it was just used as a handle ornament sometimes maybe it's a tactile method to use edge control or to, to know how to grip the katana you know it's everybody's idea on that's different there's scholars written whole papers on it anyway as you see here these are the makugi these are the bamboo pins which hold this whole suka in place. This is a suba, the hand guard, as it were. This particular one is made of iron. The uh, suba is really just to keep the hand from sliding onto the blade. It's not really meant for parrying and stuff like that. Uh, most styles of Japanese swordsmanship don't use a whole lot of parrying. Um, some is usually done with the spine or the side of the blade. Uh, this is really just to keep your hand, like I say, from sliding forward. None of that. Now, here together with all this is a sepa joining the two together. This is a habaki. Some people call it a blade collar. And you see here, here's our habaki. And it's not really a blade collar, and it's really hard to describe what the habaki is in English without using the habaki as a term. By the way, I'm not Japanese. I do not speak Japanese. Most a lot of these terms I've only seen written. The people I've talked talked with about them in training and whatnot also were not Japanese and probably pronounced these terms wrong themselves. There's different schools of thought on how some of these are pronounced. So if you are a Japanese speaker, please forgive the murdering of your words that I'm doing here. But this is Hobaki. I guess say it's called a blade collar, but Hobaki has several functions. It has been called the heart of the Japanese sword, and that's very very true. For one, the habaki seats the sword tightly into the saya, which is a scabbard. Seats it tightly in there so it sits. But not only that, it makes it so the blade hovers in the saya without touching the sides. This is important for corrosion. As the blade touching the wood, and the wood could absorb water, whatnot, and that causes corrosion on the blade. So the blade actually hovers in the saya because of the habaki. Now, in addition to that, 
The Habaki also serves a role in shot transference. You strike with a Japanese sword and what's on a European sword called the center of percussion on Japanese swords Manushi here. And that's the ideal harmonic spot to strike. And if you do that, the shock transfer down the blade through the habaki using the sepa. The sepa, nice tight assembly and flow of the sepa with the suba, all that transfers the shock and disperses it out throughout the whole sword instead of all of it being absorbed by the suka here. Very important. It's very well done on a Ronin brand. It's not so much well done on other brands. Very well done on this brand. Okay, so we've seen the Nabaki, the Seppa, Suba. Now we look at the blade. This is a kind of standard Shinogi Sakuri, the most common shape blade. And it's called that because of the geometry. This ridge line that runs down here is the Shinogi. Literally means ridge in Japanese. So you have parallel almost surfaces here, the Shinogi are. And then it starts slanting down towards the Ha. Or the edge, and those are called uh, the G. This flat surface up here are called the Shinogi G, above the ridge. Here is a Kasaki. The tip is a Kasaki. These are the Koshinogi. This is the extension of the Shinogi into the Kasaki. The curve of the Kasaki is called the Fukura. Now, this line of demarcation here is called Yokote. Your cote can be physical, they can be non-physical, they can be counter-polished, either one's historically correct. Originally what the cote is, it's just a change of geometry as the blade switches from approaching the geometry approaching the edge to it approaching the point. And the cote would install itself, thusly. And swords have, after swords have been polished and polished and polished, the cote would become cosmetic, counter-polished on. That's the blade lost a lot of meat. And that's a real cost saving measure for production katana today, so we see that in a lot of production katana. Now, looking at the saya, we have the kogushi. It's usually made out of buffalo horn, and that's just the mouth of a saya. That's all. This is a sagio. And this is, this is a chemical fiber. This can be chemical fiber, silk, cotton. What this is for, this is a decorative knot tied on it for display, but it, it's, you would disconnect this and you'd use this to tie the saya to the obi when you're wearing the, the sword. And you keep it from falling out of the obi. And here is the kogata. And that is, obviously you can see, for the sagio. And Hirushi lacquer is usually used to make the nice black piano finish we see on the saya. So there you have it. And that is the parts of the Japanese sword and how they all work together. You've seen the Nakago and it goes into the Suka and you can see a lot of people say full tang Japanese sword is really not full tang. A Japanese sword about three quarters, a little more and that's appropriate, historic. And that's how it all goes together. So, while we're doing our destructive test, we're going to be looking for suka to fail because of bad shock transference with the sepa and habaki and zuba, which I don't think we're going to see. We have this nice flow here. I think we have good shock transference. We're going to be looking for makugi pins to fail, which I don't think we'll see. One of the nice things about bamboo and why the Japanese use them is fibrous. And even if it cracks, it's going to splinter and leave long rather than breaking in half. 